BMW Motorrad turned 90 last year, and in the middle of a flurry of extreme performance bikes and high-tech tourers, it seems they've had a chance to get a little introspective. The R9T is a modern classic, a rolling walk down memory lane that harks back to design elements from the old R90 Beamers of the 70s. The thin flat seat, the knee scoops in the tank, the spoked wheels, the very sexy single bucket headlight. All things that BMW is sort of slowly moving away from as it rebrands itself with a much more sporty focus. This thing is a real charmer to look at, even in stock form, but it's clearly not designed to be left that way. Six bolts and your pillion subframe comes off and you can fit a rear cowl for a cafe racer look. A few extra bolts and the back seat's gone all together, giving it a chunky street fighter look. There's even a couple of spare bolt holes if you want to fit a wraparound number plate behind the rear wheel, like the one on the 1200 GS. If you want to go all out, take a look at what these four Japanese custom builders were able to do with it. Extraordinary. Going back to the GS, that's where the engine and drivetrain came from. Not the latest liquid-cooled model, but the previous air and oil-cooled donk that ran until 2013. Like BMW's very first bike back in 1923, it's got the big fat side boobs of an opposed twin or boxer engine. It displaces 1170 cc's, packs a huge flywheel, and it's got such a meaty torque reaction that it throws the bike sideways when you rev it at a standstill, which actually feels really cool, but it makes every drongo you sit next to at the lights think that you're gunning for a drag race. They're in trouble if you are. The 90's got a pretty hairy chest when you open up the throttle. It peaks at about 110 brake horsepower, but by the time you get up there, it's kind of running out of breath, to be honest. It's all about the grunt and snarl of that low end and mid range. I don't know what BMW is doing to get a stock exhaust to sound this good, but the best way to enjoy this bike is just to sit in the low end and mid range and just let it sing you a song in baritone. It's deep and rich and gorgeous. This is a deliberately low-tech machine. It runs ABS brakes, but they're not switchable, and there's basically nothing else to play with. You can't even get heated hand grips as an option. You've just got to sack up and tough it out like your grandpa used to when, when he rode it in the snow every day with no gloves and an old biscuit tin for a helmet. Oh, those were the days. The R9T only comes in one colour, but it's the right colour. Black Storm Metallic, they call it, but it's so deep and glossy that it's, it's really the colour of sunsets and streetlights and really ugly mugs. All this black and silver sets the stage for an outrageously golden pair of forks, non-adjustable versions of the S1000RR's upside-down race jobbies with radial brake calipers on the boots. Normally on a naked boxer beamer like the R1200R, you'd find the excellent telelever or duo lever front suspension systems, which do a boot job of controlling brake dive coming into corners. But I guess they wouldn't fit with the 90s visual identity, and that's a pity really. You do get the paralever system, that's this extra lever and this pivoty thing here. Rigid shaft drives have a tendency to push the back end upwards under acceleration. The paralever more or less sorts that problem out. Being a shafty, there's no chain to clean or maintain, but on the other hand, it's heavier and you can't change your gear ratios as easily. The 90 is a really wonderful bike to look at. It seems to stir the loins of young and old alike, but it does make a few compromises to get there. For starters, these spoked wheels look really nice, but you can't run tubeless tyres on them, which means you can't fix a puncture by the side of the road without pulling the wheel off and getting the tyre off the rim to patch the tube. Bugger that. For about 120 bucks, you can get a flexible tape that seals the spoke heads and converts the rims to take tubeless tyres. Personally, I'd be doing that straight away. Mind you, the 9T gives you exactly zero storage space to carry a repair kit. I can't even work out how to get the seat off without a Torx key. Speaking of Torx keys, I really wish BMW would get over this Torx bolt thing. I've done a lot of miles and a lot of dodgy roadside repairs on a lot of different bikes. I need a bike I can fix with tools that your average farmer has in his shed. Cows and tractors don't use Torx bolts, motorbikes shouldn't either. Especially not to get the seat off, come on! Anyway, the seat looks great, and it's quite comfy for about an hour, but how can we put this delicately? It compresses a nerve that male cyclists will be familiar with. After about an hour and a half on the highway, I stopped for petrol and discovered I'd lost contact with Private Johnson. It took me a couple of minutes to slap the old fella back into life. Not a good look. 
The gearbox could really do with a bit more feedback. It's kind of hard to tell if a gear's gone in or not. I suspect that's why the gear position indicator is the biggest thing on the whole dash. It's been a while since I rode a boxer, so I can't remember if that's just what they're supposed to be like, but if any other bike felt this way, I'd be adjusting the chain until it felt better. If you start riding it hard, you've got to take care on your downshifts. There's no slipper clutch and the engine braking can be pretty savage. So unless you like your booty swinging freely in the wind, you'd better blip that throttle. The power delivery as well, it's kind of snatchy off a closed throttle. And that's a typical symptom that this fuel map's been leaned off to get the bike under emissions targets. If you check the owner forums, you can find plenty of tuners who can remap your fuel delivery and smooth this kind of thing out but you'll be killing the planet, you selfish bastard. So yeah, there's a few niggles that I'd want to sort out if I owned one, but niggles can sometimes equal character. And all of that aside, this is still a really satisfying bike to ride. It handles nicely up to about seven tenths for me. When you start bouncing around and sort of wishing the shock had some more rebound damping in it. There's a beaut little hand adjuster for the preload, but you need a hex key to change the rebound, and I didn't have one. Might be one under the seat, I don't know. Can't get the seat off. Needs a Torx key. Arrgh. Anyway, the 9T isn't gonna scare the pants off you like the last Beamer I rode. It just feels good and content and capable and deadly cool. It feels like dusty old roads and open-faced lids and campfire sunsets and cops that'd wave you on for 10 over. Makes me kind of yearn for a motorcycling past I wasn't even around to experience. I do remember that when I was a kid, my dad used to sit me on his knee and putt round the backyard on a bike my granddad made out of lawnmower and wheelbarrow bits. The 9T had me feeling kind of wistful and reminiscent for those good old days, so I thought I might take it round to show him. So, uh, what do you reckon? Well, it's a pretty good looking machine. In fact, I don't mind motorbikes, it's uh, some of the dickheads who ride them that really bother me. <laughs> <laughs>